Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 840. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is January 26th, 2024. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're here to, to do what we do best. This is our happy place. We look at the stories on the internet that interest us. Most of them are Anglican. Some of them are Christian. Some of them are politics. Once in a while, it's weather. And this is what George and I do. We talk about what we see. We are journalists. We try to ride both sides, two sides to every story. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes we don't. But let's move on george how are you doing this week i'm just doing great we had a pet fair at the church last saturday feast of saint anthony the great of e- or anthony of egypt uh patron saint of domestic animals we had horses uh dogs cats parrots mm-hmm. snakes goats guinea pigs a whole menagerie it was a wonderful time yeah. and i learned that mccall's like me because otherwise they would have taken my finger off their handler said uh, <laughs> if they squeeze your hand you're fine if they bite it your finger off well there you go yeah so uh i uh, am finally back on the bicycle i i i let you guys know i had a the flu and rsv probably back to back uh this fall and i've been sick since december uh, last week, I finally felt better. I waited a couple more days, and now I'm back on the bike. Uh, every year for the last six years, I've done at least 5,000 miles on the bike in a year. And I hope to do it this year, but I'm already behind, George. I'm so far behind. I got three rides in, and it's the 26th. And, oh, well, maybe I'll get 4,000. We'll see. So that's, that's good here. Uh, let's cover the weather. It's 82 today. George, you got your wool suit on, or what do you? How, how are you f- holding out? No, actually, we're doing quite nice. Uh, the uh, weather's changed down here in Florida, as you say. It's in the eighties. It was eighties yesterday, and uh, just spring is starting. The buds are coming out. Uh, winter's over. I hope so. All right, let's move on to the news, and uh, we got a couple big stories. The biggest story, you're not going to believe it, but it's Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby does a U-turn on the LLF per Colin Coward. He is postponing the imi- the implementation of standalone prayers and new pastoral guidance, but why would he do that? I thought he had the upper hand. I thought he had the power and the authority, according to the Synod, to do this. What's going on, George? Well, that's what the liberal side of the Church of England wants to know. Uh, Welby had 17 uh, liberal pressure groups, lobbying groups, to land with the palace over the past few days. Um, while they were there, he basically informed them that they were, he was putting a halt on creating standalone prayers for same-sex blessings, which was authorized by the last General <clears throat> Senate, and the pastoral guidelines uh, for how to use them and how to not to use them uh, also were put on hold while they worked out how structural differentiation would work. Now, this was a double blow. Structural differentiation is where those opposed to same-sex blessings would have their either their own third province, or they would have something that would give them different bishops. We don't know what it is because they haven't worked it out yet. Now, Synod has voted this down a number of times, saying no to structural differentiation. And now Welby is essentially saying, well, the conservatives are demanding this, and we're going to give it to them. Now, first off, let me just say, this has not been confirmed by any official <clears throat> state from the palace. Mm-hmm. This has just come out of the meetings that Welby and his team have had with the uh, leaders of the liberal pressure groups, sort of breaking the news to them over the past few days. Now, have we heard anything from Jane Ozan? She would certainly be on this topic real quick. She uh, resigned from General Center, though she's very active in the pressure groups. Yeah, uh, We haven't heard anything uh, from her yet. Um, but what I think, and um, this is my speculation, when Nikki Gumbel, the former rector of Holy Trinity Brompton and the Alpha Fellow, went to meet with the Global South primates in Cairo. 
he told them that he was going to let Justin Welby know that the Alpha Network would basically stand in his way unless differentiation were permitted. And that could either be lawsuits, it could be financial, could be any unspecified threat. And then we've heard nothing since from Nikki Gumbel. We've had uh, official statements in Parliament and in General Synod. Have we been sued? Have <laughs> Nikki Gumbel followed up on these promises? And the answer is no, there's been no litigation. But I'm fairly confident that the old boy network is at work, you know, two Etonians, if you will, uh, Gumbel and Welby, and Gumbel saying, look, uh, Justin, if if you want this, you've got to give us that. So I, th I think the, uh, I, that's where I see the pressure coming from. Well, because we, the, conserv uh, they, the Church of England Evangelical Council and other leaders, public leaders, have been very forthright about what they want, but they've been ignored time and again, time and again. So what's the change? Mm. Well, we learned early on that the lawyers said that the, that uh, Justin Welby can't do this. Mm -hmm. And so maybe there's some follow-up there. He doesn't feel he has the footing to do it anymore uh, the way he wanted to do it. And uh, we'll have to see. I mean, uh, the Church of England has separated itself from the Anglican Communion. And I think that, that can be very apparent when we report on the new <coughs> Archbishop. So... Well, let, let's just sort of walk this out a bit <clears throat> further. If there is a genuine U-turn, then I think that then Welby can basically save the Church of England from being disfellowship mm -hmm. from the majority of the Anglican world. If this is just an opportunity to create a cocoon or a lifeboat or a castle for a group within the Church of England, then the then the juggernaut will continue and the Church of England will be, if you will, replaced in the hearts and minds of Anglicans in Nigeria and Kenya and Uganda and whatnot with whatever this new place is. So I have to ask, you know, to whose advantage is this? Well, certainly it's to the conservatives' advantage. It also is to the financial advantage of the Church of England because if we do have a breakup, that means breaking up a lot of stuff which takes would take years and would involve litigation and how do we split up the uh, uh, church commissioners funding and all this and that um, so i think welby is trying to prevent the internal collapse of the church of england by giving the conservatives what they want up to a point so we'll see how this unfolds yeah. but it will it, it certainly will prick up the prick up the ears of the Global South primates, because they probably will see this as a sign of weakness from Welby, that he now, doesn't have his own house in order. Most of our viewers, maybe they all do, uh, don't get the Church Times, I'm assuming. The Church Times has an op-ed saying, listen, on LLF, can't we all just get along here? What? Come on, guys. Well, part of these meetings at, at Lambeth Palace was with was with the two new bishops commissioned by the Archbishop's Council or the College of Bishops to take LLF forward on the next level. And that's Helen Ann Hartley, the Bishop of Newcastle in the north of England, and Martin Snow, the Bishop of Leicester. And they've pu published this morning an op-ed piece in the Church Times which essentially says... Uh, can't we just get along? And they start off with the trope of uh, American politics being so nasty and divisive. And now the Church of England seems to be going that direction. Let's just stop and realize that we're doing higher things, more important things here than politics. We're trying to find God's will. So let's not treat each other as amalekites to be smote hip and thigh, but rather as fellow Christians trying to discern God's will for the Church of England. So. In, in summary, it is a call to lower temperatures, allow dialogue, allow things to sort of settle down. That coupled with the ev evident, uh, evidently the pullback from Welby of going ahead regardless of the consequences on gay blessings, 
might achieve something. We may see a, a cooling because uh, <clears throat> this will steal the thunder from some of those who are looking to say, get out, get out now from the Church of England. It's giving another, another, and, and to be perfectly frank, for most English vicars who are, say, of my age, you know, <clears throat> we got 10 years to go. 10 to go. Um, uh. Hear the song of just wait, hold on, something will be done, then have to go and start all over again. Uh, it's just human nature. Yeah, it is. Now, for people watching this program, George and I have a, a little bit of internet uh, interference between our two locations. He's freezing up a little bit, but his audio is still good. Uh, we rebooted in before because the audio was bad. So we, we got what we got. Uh, the next story, Calvin Robinson affair or the mere Anglicanism affair continues to build. Uh, as you may or may not have heard, Calvin Robinson was a speaker at mere Anglicanism 2024 this year. And after his talk, he was asked by the organizers to no longer uh, participate and he would not be allowed to participate in the panel discussion at the end. He was not told to leave. He was not uh, sent on his way. Uh, he was not kicked out of the forum. But, you know, what would cause the, uh, the mere Anglicanism people to do this? And you look at his topic. His topic was critical race theory, and uh, I read the, his notes, and he covered that very well. Um, so this is going to be a big topic. Uh, I interviewed Jeff Walton on it, and half the world liked it, half the world hated the interview. So we, we yeah. need to, to talk this all out, George. Kevin, our friend Gavin Ashenden on his podcast, mm -hmm. uh, Ashenden Unscripted, okay. uh, took, it, took, it, took a dig at you. What? At the, on our at our program oh, no. for having Jeff Walton, uh -huh. not uh, Calvin Robinson. Well, hold on. And we let, discussed yeah, stop. Let, why, let me, why do well, we? Well, hold on. Let me answer that. When I wanted to interview somebody, and I only have a limited time, I'm a business person, I work a real job, Calvin Robinson was on a plane from South Carolina to England. So I asked Jeff, Jeff, could you, you were a Y witness. Now, Jeff said, yes, of course. Now, when I do news programs, uh, I'm a journalist. There's two sides to every story, one and two, sometimes three. I knew Jeff could give me a delightful guess at both sides because he had talked to Calvin after the incident. So that gave me more of an in to go. Uh, if I had just put Calvin on without having the diocese or mere Anglicanism or the bishop respond... That it's a one-sided story. What does what good does that do anybody? No matter who's right here, a one-sided story is not news. That's how bloggers work. That's how other YouTubers work. But for 15 years of Anglican unscripted and Anglican TV, we have tried to let you discern what is the true story by giving you both sides. This isn't what Kevin discerns. My God, it would be a horrible show if this was just about what Kevin thinks. So I, I want to put that out there. Why didn't I have Kevin Robinson Im immediately? First of all, he was flying home. Second of all, it would not have been fair because it's a one-sided story. Even though I tend to agree with Kevin's side of the story. Just saying. Well, it's it's one of these things where I... I uh, yeah. I'm a little discomforted because I like the people on both sides. I they're do, no, too. Yeah. <laughs> they're, in other words, it's always fun when you yeah. pick on the Archbishop of Canterbury because he's a cartoon villain at this stage. Yeah, at uh, this point, know. yeah, he's a Dilbert character. But at, at this stage, the uh, mere Anglicanism side of the, t of the equation, I would say, needs to get their message a little more polished because we're getting conflicting messages. Jeff M Jeffrey Miller, the uh, director of the mere Anglicanism Canism conference put out a note of clarification where he denied that he or Calvin was canceled on because of his views on women's orders, but quote, and I'll read it because he failed to address in his plenary presentation, the topic that was assigned to him. That's not true. So, well, that's what Jeff, Jeffrey Miller said. Okay. Then Bishop Edgar put out a letter where basically he roasted Calvin for his uh, women's ordination comments. So which is it? Is it not following directions, not following uh, or upsetting the audience? 
because um, you know it's we do not now Calvin is very precise very particular man he uh, believe me he's fought these battles with the Church of England in uh -huh. his ordination process yeah. so there's no tricks that he doesn't not worth not tricks but there's no techniques uh, to catch him out uh, for overstatements because he's very precise and meticulous in what he says and so here we have a a failure of minds to meet maybe it was a failure ahead of time to sort of lay out what the it was expected and now we have these hurt feelings on both sides where calvin was canceled mid-conference and we've got those who rejoice whenever the issue of women's orders comes up because then we can then we have the cassandra saying oh i told you these this you know act will Church never will yeah. never yeah. never last because yeah. of this issue um and people come at it from different directions but george you're so, missing the hold on you're missing the big point here Everybody's mad at Kevin. They're not mad at Calvin. They're not mad at mere Anglicanism. Uh, if you read the comments, and you guys should do this, go through here. Um, it, most people do not know what they're talking about as far as mm -hmm. how journalism works. And you didn't have Calvin on. Oh, last time I tried to contact Calvin, it was a two-month wait. You know, it's it's not like he's he's ready and willing, but apparently this time he was uh, uh, to talk about it. I mean... Well, yeah, so, and and other things have pop, popped out. Uh, Calvin's bishops, the consecrate ordinating or bishops of ordination, the Nordic Catholic Church have you know popped in in his favor. But more importantly, Eric Meniz, the president of Ford and Faith, and Bishop of San Joaquin, has spoken out in favor of C Calvin and his position. So we basically need somebody of stature to smooth the waters here. And not but not just uh, that's not the just difficulty. dismiss one side or the other because the this is a profound this can be a profound crisis if not managed. This is the and not addressed in a Christian way. This is the toughest topic in the ACNA. It is the elephant in the room in many of the places that I visit and many of the people I talk to. Uh, because <laughs> well, hold on, let me finish this idea out here. Calvin's thought on women's orders is the original thought it's not the new thought it's not the new uh teaching it's not the, the you know it was it it was the original way it was done for thousands of years the new situation here is women's orders have been introduced uh first in the church of england uh in, in the episcopal church in canada and now around the world uh including some african nations uh in gafcon and so we find ourselves with new and we watch what that new kind of did in the church of england and it, it wasn't great we watch what that new did to the episcopal church it destroyed it we watch what the new did to canada and the canada doesn't want to talk about it so you know it's a difficult topic in the acna because i'm going to be frank here there are some women who do do justice to the title of priest in the acna did i said it I'm going to say something else. If you ask me, oh boy, this is, I'm going to be in so much trouble. Kevin, would you recommend women's orders? Uh, I couldn't recommend it because of what I saw with what happened to the Church of England, with what happened to the Episcopal Church and uh, the Methodist Church and uh, churches around the world. It didn't work, but I don't know if it, it didn't work because they were just promoting liberal women. I don't know. But uh, they also promoted liberal men, which made it a mess as well. So this I, I can't recommend it, but I, I I'll big, bring this big. However, there are not many women in the ACNA who uh, bring a great honor to the office, but there are some. I I know them. And, and <laughs> now see, I'm so I come at I, it. I, I'm so dead. It's over. No, no. No, the show's no. over. You know, I got Kelvin Robinson mad at me. I got the C. I got all the uh, 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 forward of faith people mad at me. Now I got the women mad at me. Okay, George. I, I come at it from a very different perspective because mm -hmm. I have a very low church worldview mindset. I come out of the American evangelical tradition. 
which is not the Church of England's evangelical no, tradition, no, no. but the American evangelical tradition, which has a lower view of the uh, uh, essentials. So for me, women's orders is a second order issue. Now, as we saw in the Diocese of Fort Worth's letter uh, from the Standing Committee uh, in December, for Fort Worth, it's a first order issue because they believe that the validity of the sacraments is at stake and there's uncertainty about the validity of a sacrament performed by a woman priest. Mm -hmm. Not because she is unworthy in her own character, but because she cannot, by her very biological makeup, Gender, stand yeah, in Santa yeah. Christi. Mm -hmm. um, I hate to, I don't want to sound flip, but that's really not an issue for me. Um, I'm not an Anglo-Catholic on that point. Um, so I, I take it as it comes, if you will. Uh, in other words, I'm fairly pragmatic in that I have no excellent women priests. I know dreadful women priests. I know excellent male priests. I know dreadful male priests. And uh, I have a woman deacon who assists me here. Uh, before death and retirement struck, I had uh, three female de uh, four female deacons and one male deacon here. And uh, I'm, I can work with them, I can work with anybody. Mm -hmm. Because for me, what is central of, is the preaching of God's word. Um, and, and I don't share the pulpit with the deacons, so it's just me up there and then the bishop every so often. But, but not to make light of this, but this is an issue that the leadership of the ACNA has been able to finesse, whether it's been Bob Duncan, uh, who was in favor, or Foley Beach, who's opposed. Mm -hmm. They've been able to find a way for all to work together to build for the greater good and not make a decision that creates winners and losers. In some respects, they've lived out what the two Church of England bishops want. Can't we all get along? But I think uh, the ACNA has been able to model that. And if this Calvin episode is not addressed, then I think we will see cracks form because now, people will say, hey, wait a second, this is just unfair to me and to my team and to my point of view. Now, I would say that women's orders was the main topic at the last conclave to pick an archbishop. Mm. You and I heard a lot of stuff. Nobody would tell us anything official. I think the most official thing we heard is it was like passing a pineapple. Okay, uh, you know it's it's a not, difficult not you mean in a uh, not this way, but over the toilet, elementary sense, <laughs> yes. not in a passing it from <laughs> yes, one person yes. to another. Right, and so um, it is a difficult. I grant you, it's a difficult topic, and I grant you, my opinion is not popular. George's opinion is not popular on this. Um, and I think the church is going to be divided. The ACNA will be divided by forever having diocese be able to choose a way on this weighty topic. You know. Well, I, th I think that's actually the best way because it does not force the issue until such time as the church comes to a consensus. The, the issue is front um, and center now. Well, it takes time. And, you know, there was, we had. In Anglican history, church history, we've had precedents where we had the issue of slavery in the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. North and South didn't quite agree. <clears throat> and there were Northern bishops. The Bishop of Vermont was very pro slave. And there was the Southern bishop who was anti slave. Yeah. And the Episcopal Church decided not to decide until the war was over. And in essence, we allowed, uh, now that's not a, uh, but that's not a uh, principled approach, but it prevented. Southern, the Presbyterians and the Southern Presbyterians, the Methodists and the Southern Methodists, the Baptists, the American Baptists and the Southern Baptists, and so on and so on and so on and so on. The, the church did not split. It held, held together because there was some charity towards the understanding of the other and just realizing that we will work this out over time. Um, but, but by setting uh, deadlines, we're giving ourselves grief that we really don't need. No, my. All right, well, we, we? we talked this topic to death. George, let's move on to another story in our repertoire. Uh, let's see here. Calvin Robinson. Uh, you said that 
And if people hear the AC in the background, it's 81 degrees in here. I can't stand it anymore. I turn the AC back on. Uh, Trinidad Diocese is issuing new COVID restrictions. Masking, social distancing, use that stuff you put in your hands. The whole works. Why? Claude Berkeley is the Bishop of Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. And Trinidad, uh, since uh, Christmas, has had nine COVID deaths. And this new JN1, I think it is, variant of COVID has been uh, reported on the island. And so Bishop Berkeley has ordered masking. Uh, he's requiring clergy to mask, uh, gloves, um, intinction only. And he's asking congregations to do social distancing and wear masks. He's not requiring the people. Churches are still open. The clergy are under the full COVID rigor of two years ago. And the people are encouraged to do that. Um, now, the health issue, health scare is real, but I think the uh, remedies he's proposing, the six foot social distancing, one of the things we just learned before testimony for Congress from um, Dr. Fauci is that uh, there's no really, they just came up with that to say something. There's no it was, scientific it, it, it evidence was that, that has anything to do. But, okay, from a scientific purpose, here in America, COVID, for the most part, the, the current strain of COVID is non-fatal. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have to have some serious comorbidity issues going on to die from the current strain of COVID. Do they have a different strain over there? Uh, they have, evidently, there's another strain going around, but uh, again, one of the things we learned from the uh, CDC is that they fudged the figures. So if you died of uh, heart failure while you had COVID, that was called a COVID death. Yeah. So they, you know, so we don't know whether there are some little old ladies who finally passed away from heart failure who happened to have COVID. Therefore, they're not called COVID deaths. I go to a nursing home. Thursdays is my nursing home day. I go to three <laughs> nursing homes and on there'll be a little sign saying, one person has COVID and, two, you know, please, uh, we recommend you wear a mask and all this and that. So, I mean, COVID's still going around, but they're not dying in waves. And the lockdowns and all that stuff were not have proven, were proven to be ineffective. And all the stuff that we were told in the past has turned out not all, but a good portion of it has turned out to be lies, deliberate lies from Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks. The, the scarf lady. <clears throat> okay, but well, it's still. But it, 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 another thing it, it, is an aside. Uh, World Economic Forum. Justin Welby was able to make it to that, but he couldn't make it to the consecration of the Archbishop of Singapore. But uh, they're now talking about uh, uh, pandemic X that we need now to get ready for the next massive major pandemic that will kill people and start getting regulations and things in order to in essence, shut down and lock down society once again. <clears throat> well, we do know they do. They need to do something different because what they did last time, they did horrible. The human society is not pandemic able. You know, mm -hmm. we're not we're not able to do pandemics very well. Uh, we didn't do the 1912 very, very well. We didn't do the Black Plague very well, and we didn't do COVID very well. So, if they can come up with a plan that makes it well without shutting down society, I'll, I'll listen to their concerns. But uh, I stopped getting COVID boosters. I, I just, my body can't take it anymore. You know, mm -hmm. last time I got a COVID booster, okay, I'm not a conspiracy person. I don't believe these shots are conspiracy, okay? Um, but last time I got a COVID booster, I became a type two diabetic again for six months. My blood sugar just shot through the roof. Um, and uh, I was in the, 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 the 230 range, which if you're type 2, you know, that's, that's horrible. And my doctors couldn't figure it out. They, but they finally had other people who had the booster come up with type 2 again uh, for about six months. And they, they said, well, we think it was the booster you got. Uh, you, your blood sugar is finally returning to normal. And that's just what, that's my body. That's what my body did with the booster. I, I, but I'm not a conspiracy, I'm becoming one, but I'm not currently a conspiracy person when it comes to the COVID shots. But I think we handled the pandemic horribly, George. Yeah. I read two books uh, recently over the Christmas holidays, one by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and yeah. the other by Rand Paul about the COVID 
pandemic and my goodness uh i'll summarize both books for you somebody better go to jail because part of this was power empire building part of this was just plain greed and part of this was just sloppy lousy science people lying to us from yeah. the government uh we, lying we, under oath. we we now have Fauci under oath admitting that he funded the the uh uh, drug studies in China and and, and funded viral studies in, in China at the Wahoo Wuhan whatever facility we, we got that last month I'm like okay I'm not a conspiracy guy well now I am you know it's like I just like oh lord but we, we don't do pandemics well yeah we, I mean, we, part of I didn't go to the last Episcopal Church General Convention yeah uh, both for two reasons one they would require everybody to get a vaccination uh boosters and have little cards and you know i wasn't going to do that i had to get my shot the first time around but after things i just said no it's enough for me um and they basically science is uh mate science you, you pick your scientists the way you pick your lawyer or politician the the idea that there is a scientific truth is dead at least in the American part died with Galileo yep so all right let's move on to some other news here uh, oh here. there are a host of people and I always think of Jim and Tammy who say God made me do it uh, God's reason uh, you can go back to you know certain uh, murderous people throughout history strange people um, you know God made me do it so I was oddly compelled by Ted Koppel to watch an interview with Gene Robinson where he said God called me out of the closet and boy I don't I I want him just to go and and uh, retire in the field and disappear um, your not your actions but people's reactions to who you were destroyed the Episcopal Church yeah and so um, I, I, and I felt sorry for him because he still doesn't know why he doesn't know well I feel badly for Gene Robinson I do too um, he's not been able to maintain healthy relationships with either male or female partners he's not found uh, fulfillment in his work as a priest he's not he's always looking for the next thing and he basically has substituted his desires for the voice of the Holy Spirit in his heart. Allegedly. Allegedly. We're, we're not here to libel or defame Gene Robinson. Uh, he has my sympathy. Well, yeah. you know, I, I, one of my old saws, oft-repeated stories, uh, is that 25 years ago when I had a parish down in Sebastian, Florida, I uh, was preaching a series on the Holy Spirit, and I had uh, not very many wealthy people in the congregation, and we needed a new roof for the parish hall. And I uh, talked about how the Holy Spirit can speak to you and let you know God's will for your life. And we had one millionaire, and he was the guy who owned all the orange groves that were being turned into little tract houses. A uh, cowboy with a flat top crew cut, real Florida cracker. And he asked for an appointment, he came in, and he started off and he told my secretary that the Holy Spirit had been speaking to him and he wanted to talk to Father George about it. So I was rubbing my hands together going, oh, goody, 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 you know, do I want a tin roof or a tile roof? What would look nice? <laughs> Gold leaf. You know, God was answering this. And he walks in and he says, George, the Holy Spirit has spoken to me and he's told me to leave my wife and marry my secretary. And I said, I believe a spirit has spoken to you, but it's not the Holy Spirit. Well, needless to say, the Presbyterians got a new roof, not us, because I didn't uh, jump on that bandwagon. But it is so easy to convince ourselves that what we want and a sense of something higher is telling us that, that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. And you can be fooled. But yet now you know how I, what can I say with absolute certainty? He can't leave his wife to marry a secretary because it's contrary to the plain word of God in scripture. Gene Robinson has the same sense that my, uh, 
my uh, orange grove owner has had, which was uh, God has spoken to me and given me a special revelation about myself. Well, I know that that revelation is not from the Holy Spirit because it contradicts scripture and is basically demonic. And one of the sad things is, is that Gene Robinson, after all these years now, it's over 20 years since all this stuff, he's still not happy. He's still not settled. He's still not at peace with himself. And Ted Koppel gave him a real softball of an interview. Uh, but, uh, oh my. It's, it's odd because he was surrounded by people who absolutely endorsed that lifestyle that celebrated him he was a celebrity for um, what God called him up for and he was he's still unhappy still not fulfilled and you know that some people live by lies and they like to tell themselves stories and one of the stories Gene Robinson loves to tell is Matthew Shepard which is the young man who was murdered out in Wyoming and there's a little the Episcopal cult church is trying to make a cult out of Matthew Shepard as a gay martyr. Well, the reality is that he wasn't a gay martyr. He was murdered by one of his gay lovers over a drug deal gone bad. And what the Episcopal church, Gene Robinson and the Washington National Cathedral and people have done is to basically take these lies and create fictional plaster saints that tell a false story and that's the whole, I, I think in a nutshell, the lie about Matthew Shepard is a lie about human sexuality and homosexuality. That it can be, that it can be blessed, that it can be from God, that it can be good, it can be wholesome. Well, Paul tells us otherwise. But also, Paul also tells us adulterers and drunkards and fornicators. Yes. So it's not singling out one group of people. Greedy rather, people, greedy people like Kevin. You know, you know I, I, none of us, uh, are without sin, and you know, I, you, I'm not trying to point out yours because I know mine. I got mine, uh, not always under control. Let's go on here. The ACNA bishops met in Melbourne, and uh, we have six new bishops, maybe seven, approved by the College of Bishops. What's the story, George? Well, the ACNA had their uh, winter meeting in Melbourne. They are uh, preparing for the election of a new primate this summer in uh, Latrobe, PA, St. Vincent's, St. Leo's, St. Somebody's College. Yeah. Uh, Catholic College in Latrobe, <laughs> PA. And they uh, affirmed the election of a number of diocesan and suffragan bishops. And they also affirmed the election of Paul Donison to be an area bishop in the Diocese of the South, suffragan to Foley Beach. Uh, Paul Donison was appointed, elected bishop, assistant bishop of Cassaba in the Anglican Church of Rwanda. And Laurent Lavanda, the primate of Rwanda, who was the head of GAFCON, he wanted the general secretary to be of Episcopal order, uh, then asked Foley Beach, and Foley Beach took it up with the Acta bishops, and the Acta bishops said, yes, we'll accept Paul as a bishop, and his jurisdiction will be as an area bishop under Foley Beach in Texas. He would be the only unelected bishop in the House of Bishops? I don't know. I know he was elected by the people, the Diocese of Cassaba okay. in Rwanda. Okay, so. uh, in here, truth be told, I've sent an email to Paul Donison for an interview. He said, I'd love to, Kevin, but I'm on a plane to uh, this place, that place. He's, he's now uh, fully in the leadership of GAFCON, and he's going to be on a plane quite a bit. Uh, this would be a, a great relief for Foley Beach as he can uh, travel us. But uh, it, um, it just, I have, que I have questions. If I have questions, you obviously have questions. So that, that's how that works. Let's move on to the news here. Um, this is a, a story of George's uh, side of the woods here. Cannon to the Ordinary in central New York arrested for DUI. He had an accident. That's how they caught him. He's a prominent liberal blogger and classmate of George's in seminary, Tom Ferguson's. Normally this wouldn't make the news. Uh, only bishops who are drunk and hit cyclists make the news. But uh, because he, he went to seminary with George and he's a, a blogger, we talk about him. Well, Tom Ferguson, uh, 
was actually a year ahead of me in seminary. I think mm -hmm. he was class in 94. I was class in 95. Um, and he uh, went to work after graduation up at 815 and uh, has had a, got a PhD, I think Boston College, Boston University. He, he's had a good career. And Tom F. had been dean of Bexley Hall Seminary in uh, Ohio. And that seminary has essentially moved is, I don't want to say it's defunct, but it no longer. Uh, it's not on my radar. It's not on your radar, it, and it you know it, it's it is what it is. Okay. Uh, and he took a job to be canon of the ordinary central New York, and be canon of the ordinary's job in the Episcopal Church is essentially the bishop's enforcer. When uh, when you get drunk, when you get pulled over, when your wife files for a divorce, it's the canon of the ordinary who calls and beats you up. And poor Paul. I'm sorry, poor Tom uh, has now got uh, <clears throat> a career ending uh, yeah. if, he, if, he, if he is guilty of the charge. I don't know if he is or not. But uh, what, I, I, what I wanted to say is that, you know, we're not picking on him because Tom is a liberal. He, uh, yeah. But we see this across the board in all denominations. Uh, which Archbishop was it? The Catholic one who was stopped Court alone of San Francisco. I mean, the, yep. people have who have problems with alcohol um, need help, and uh, we shouldn't just try to be so nasty that they hide them and never seek the assistance they need to overcome yeah. a drinking yeah. problem. Um, and I have a number of uh, parishioners who have drinking problems who I love and support and try to help them. So I'm. You know, we just pray that that Tom is able to get his life straightened out and go forward and truly find a way to serve the Lord and the church. Well, you and I, I mean, I live in a basically retirement community of RVs. And uh, if they started an AA chapter here, it would be beneficial. There, there are some heavy, hard drinking people over 55. Uh, and uh, I, I hung out with them on Wednesday, and I had a one too many too. Uh, they were doing shots, and so Kevin at shot two. Oh, in college just was easy. I was <laughs> falling asleep. I'm old. I can't, you know, whatever. So yeah, drinking is an issue in, in retirement communities. I, I can assure you. Let's but go here to yeah. Given that that that's the joke about to your north and to my east is the villages. Yes, uh, which is uh, Disneyland for retirees. Yeah, and I think it has the highest rate of sexually transmitted diseases in Florida. Or you, at, at one point, it did. At one point, it did. Um, it also has the most DUIs by golf cart in the nation. I mean, the, the yes, I mean, and that would be a great place for an ACNA plant. Is the villages? Uh, just a hint out there. Yeah. But the thing is, the real estate just yes. expensive. so expensive. Yeah, I agree. With All right, next story, uh, Francis. I'm I'm assuming in your notes it's Pope Francis. Uh, Pope Francis has a new and approved Cardinal Fernandez, and apparently he has been in charge of the sex the uh, theology. And before uh, I don't get your sentence here, George. Okay. Victor Manuel Fernandez okay. is the head of the uh, CDF, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. We Anglicans think we've had a bad decade. Catholic Church has had a bad year, and they've been able to compress into one year all the stuff we took 25 years to get through. And Fernandez uh, is the one who was the author it is said of this gay blessing uh, document the Pope Francis uh, released under his signature on December 18th. Well, when he was in Buenos Aires, uh, Fernandez uh, wrote some books for young people where he talked about the joy of sex and kissing and how you can find Jesus in sexual act. Really hippy dippy 70s church what's happening now episcopal church lunacy stuff you know the, 
just a mat. I mean, I can picture the guy wearing like a turtleneck and a jacket with uh, patches on his sleeves. <laughs> yeah. about sex with teenagers doing little drops of LSD. Yes. Yeah, the, the groovy <laughs> priest. Well, this guy has become the groovy cardinal, and the other card. The war in the Catholic Church is going to is getting more serious and more serious and more serious because you've now got some of the old lions from Africa, cardinals, who are basically saying this is stuff that is coming out of Rome is heretical. It's absolutely heretical. And Victor, uh, and, the, and the point is that Francis knew all about this stuff. It wasn't that all of a sudden, oh my goodness, were you the guy who wrote this stuff? No, Francis knew all along. And yet appointed to maybe the second most important position in the papacy, the one that uh, Joseph Ratzinger held when John Paul was Pope, yeah. appointed to the CDF somebody who is flawed theologically, pastorally, and morally. So you have to, I'm asking myself, this isn't an accident. You know, what is, Francis has, has a trait, has a, a I don't know, what's the word? Francis has appointed some really questionable people to serious high office in the Catholic Church. And he knows about their problems. Now, why does he do this? I don't think he's good at discerning people. I mean, uh, I I well, am very you know, good. The, one of the, my talents. The, <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the one of the things that people write is that Francis likes to control people based on their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So maybe when you know, because without Francis, Hernandez, uh, Fernandez disappears. In other words, Fernandez needs Francis more than Francis needs Fernandez. And so basically you get the loyalty of broken, weak people by pointing them above their heads, knowing that if you go, they go too. Um, I know it's terrible to speak of an institution like the church as if it were a, a, a mafia democracy, but uh, oh my. We're getting close. We're getting close here. Oh, how much time? Uh, I had to stop the recording when we went off air. So it's 22 plus 20. We're getting close to the end here, George. We need to, to finish up. Uh, last time I went to Canterbury Cathedral, even as a press person, I had to pay to take the tour. It's now free. I feel, I feel robbed, George. Yeah, the majority of English cathedrals and uh, places like Westminster Abbey and St. George's Chapel at Windsor charge entrance fees, not for worship services, but if you want to go look at it. And the reason is that these cathedrals and uh, are very expensive to maintain the physical plant, plus they have huge staffs. I mean, they got people run, you know, running around doing all sorts of stuff. It's not cheap. I think it's something that costs like 30,000, I think it is, pounds a day or a week to run uh, Westminster Abbey. So, some a tremendous number. Well, Canterbury Cathedral is trying an experiment. Uh, they were on the show most recently because they're having uh, not a rave in the nave, but a disco uh, in the uh, disco al fresco, is some cutesy phrase. Uh, now they've uh, dropped the entrance fees for some tours. So they're trying to encourage people to come by not charging them to go see all the stuff. You know, see the tombs and this and that. And it, okay. It's worth it. If I had to pay again, I would do it. it. It's worth paying for and it's worth free. So, But you ask yourself, maybe Canterbury Cathedral is on to something. Will this... Will well, will free admission bring people on Sunday to worship? I don't think so. Hmm. But will but does paid admission drive people away from attending? Yeah, I think it does. It makes I think people resentful that this is their cathedral, their you know church, and they got to pay to walk through the door. All right, real quick, last story. This is it, guys. If I'm going to uh, help. Uh, consecrate a new archbishop and I'm in charge of the the, uh, the invitation list as an Anglican I'm gonna have some people I want it to be as shirts there 
Uh, I would invite Pope Francis, but he wouldn't come. I would invo- invite Gafcon. I would invite all the archbishops around the world. And darn it all, I would invite the Archbishop of Canterbury 10 years ago. Modern day, that seems to be optional, George. We have the consecration of the Archbishop Titus Chung of the Southeast Asia, and Foley Beach was there. All the notables were there. However, the Honorable, uh, I guess I could call him Sir now, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, was not invited. Yeah, which yeah. is uh, quite interesting. Singapore had been... All, Singapore's never been GAFCON. It had been Global South. Mm-hmm. And Global South has wanted to work with Welby. Yeah. Now, now Welby was at the World Economic Forum uh, when this... So there might have been a conflict and Welby's doing the Week of Christian Unity in Rome. Welby's calendar is full already. But it does speak to me about the the visible signs of the the divisions within the Anglican world. That we now don't have uh, a sense that it's normal for the Archbishop not to be there because we're in, in impaired communion with him. Indeed. All right. This is the show where everybody hates Kevin this week. Next week, everybody can hate George. No, or, or whatever. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 840 of Anglican Unscripted.